No matter how big you think, I think, we think our God is, he is bigger than that. He is greater than our wildest imaginings. Thank you uh, to our worship team for leading us in that great truth today. Well, uh, would you take your Bible? We're going to look uh, at two passages of Scripture. One will sort of serve as a springboard uh, into our main text today. Open with me to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. And then just a few pages over, if you have an old-fashioned Bible or if not, you have your iPad or iPhone or however it is that you get the Word of God in your hands these days, uh, then we'll look over in uh, a very familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so Romans chapter 12, and then over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. While uh, we're finding that, that uh, those, those passages, um, I did this a couple of weeks ago, and I just really feel... Um, impressed this morning that we need to do this again, and uh, I just want you to bow with me in prayer. There are three major events going on, as you well know, around the world. Uh, two we prayed over a couple of weeks ago. One is uh, upon us, uh, uh, at least upon part of our country right now. Of course, I'm speaking of all that has transpired and is continuing to take place there in Afghanistan with the tragic loss of uh, so much of our uh, of life this week, particularly those who serve in our militaries, and thinking about how many families uh, are grieving this morning uh, because of the loss of, of, uh, of loved ones. And also, of course, the ongoing needs that are there in Haiti, uh, experiencing not only an earthquake, but then a couple of storms that have also uh, uh, ravaged uh, that country that has already long been ravaged. And then finally, uh, just those on our Gulf Coast so I want to lead us in a prayer. You pray as I pray, and let's join our hearts together for these needs. Father, uh, many times the needs are so great and so vast and so overwhelmingly monumental. God, we don't even know in human terms uh, how to pray. And we're grateful then for that promise that even tells us, that reminds us that when we don't have all the right human words that your spirit will intercede on our behalf, even with groanings and utterances that we cannot uh, fathom or grasp. And so, Father, we, we pray that in all three of these situations that while we don't see it and can't understand it with human eyes today, Father, but we know that you are at work even in the midst of, 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 of evil, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of natural disaster, uh, God, we know that you're there, and we pray that uh, through it all, that even in the midst of these uh, various calamities, that somehow that the truth of the gospel will be able to be shared and that people's hearts will be open and receptive to receive what they really need, what we all need, ultimately and only, and that is Jesus. And so we just trust you to be God and because you are bigger than we can imagine, and you are greater than we can ever fathom. And so, Father, we just come now as the people of God before our Heavenly Father and to intercede on behalf of all of those who are experiencing uh, this devastation. Help us then to express our love. Let our love be done in action as we're going to kind of learn through the Word today, but help us to put feet uh, and faith to our action, if you will, uh, and to our intentions. And... Uh, Again, God, we, we just bring these things and lay them at the foot of the cross, which is the best and most important place where we can leave them, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we're going to use really two springboards today to kind of get into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first is the springboard of Connor's message last week. Wasn't that a great message? Just Connor, I'll tell you, I just appreciated that message so much last week. He blessed my, yeah, you can give the Lord a hand and just thank Connor, wherever you are out there, Connor, wherever you're seated. But uh, th I, that's a great springboard really into this series of messages. Uh, there are gonna be seven messages in total in this little series that uh, we're gonna look at entitled Love in Action, being the body. What does it mean to really be the body of Christ and put our love into action? And I thought Connor's words and his message last week was so spot on because, you know, we, we can do a lot of things, things that we need to do, things that we're, in, uh, we're, we're commanded to do, but if we do not do them out of a heart 
motivated by a love of Jesus. In other words, that Mary Martha comparison that Connor gave us last week is that we, we need to make sure that we spent time at the feet of Jesus before we, uh, kind of the Mary side, if you will, before we go to work like Martha. And it takes both. And so this series of messages is probably a little bit more leaning towards the Martha, if you will, love in action. But I thought that was a great springboard. The second springboard is really going to be the same springboard that we will use every time, all seven of these messages. And that's going to be found in Romans chapter 12. And I'm kind of limiting it to verses 9 through 13. We'll get into that in just a moment. And uh, for this reason, I love the book of Romans. Oh my goodness, what a great book. The first eight chapters of Romans is uh, doctrine, doctrinal truth. And uh, that's where we learn about salvation and justification by faith and uh, sanctification and all of those fancy theological words. But my goodness, the eight, first eight chapters are just chock full of significant doctrine, Christian doctrine, what we believe. But the last eight chapters, chapters 9 through 16, there is this shift from doctrine to duty. In other words, here's what we believe, but here's how we're going to behave. Here's what we're going to stand upon, but here's what we're going to walk towards, if you will. And so in this 12th chapter, there are some uh, there's some, ver- some verses here that, again, are going to help us kind of as a springboard. Now, uh, in verses 9 through 13, there are actually 13 different individual specific action items, love in action by doing these things. And, and the reason I'm limiting it to verses 9 through 13 is because if we went on into verses 14 through 21 of chapter 12, there are actually a grand total of 30. And so we'd be here for a, for a year to look at all of those individually. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of package these, if you will, in such a way that we can sort of put them into a, a, a seven-message series. And so with that being said, in verses 9 through 13, which we're about to read, there are those 13 individual things. And I've even, I've even gone back and kind of put those into some categories. And it's those seven categories then that will provide the themes for these messages. And so we'll kind of springboard every week off of a statement or phrase that is found in Romans chapter 12. And then we're going to go find a passage that will maybe in a more in-depth way Uh, be able to teach some truths. So today, for example, is the first of these messages, which is simply loving genuinely, loving genuinely. So uh, I want to ask you, and I'll just do this one time. I won't make you stand when we read 1 Corinthians 13, but would you stand with me in honor of our God and his word? And as a matter of fact, I don't think we've done this lately, but from time to time, I think it's good for us as an affirmation uh, of, of the uh, Word of God and our belief in the Word of God, let's read these verses together out loud as an act of worship. So I'll read along with you from our screen. Let's read together. Ready? Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. And may our God, uh, actually there's one more verse. I missed it. Let's do it. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And now may God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Thank you. Thank you. And you may be seated. Now, of those 13 individual little things that we just read, as I said, we're going to package seven of those, and today's going to be loving fervently. And as we go through this uh, series, we're going to hit some topics on living honorably. We're going to talk about examining honestly. And by the way, on that day, we will celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper together. We're going to talk about serving faithfully. We're going to talk about, this is a hard one, waiting patiently. That's a tough one. We're going to talk about giving generously, and we'll end this series with praying fervently. But for today, we're going to kind of jump off of these springboards, and we're going to talk about loving genuinely. 
What does it mean to truly love in action? And what does that really mean? Well, you may very well know that there are four New Testament words that are always translated just into one English word. And our English word is the word love. And you know, we kind of overuse that word. And, and when you think about it, it's the only word that we have in our English language. And we can love everything from our dog to, our, to pizza, to our car, to our kids, to God. I mean, and, and how do you use one word to you know, kind of express such a range, if you will? And that's why in the New Testament, there were actually four original words and they were very, very specific in the type of love that's being described. And so here are those words. Uh, one is the word phileo. We get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Well, the word phileo was the Greek term that meant just that, brotherly love, friendship kind of love. Then there was the word eros, from which we get our word erotic. And that was the word that was used to describe the kind of love that is reserved for the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And then there was the word storge. The word storge was family love. It's a little deeper than the phileo kind of love. It's the love that I would have for my two sons and our two granddaughters and our extended family. And then finally, there is the word which you probably have heard most, and that is the word agape. And agape is God's love. It is the love that only God can display but that even as children of God, people of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, is that, listen to this, we have the opportunity of living out and expressing agape love, God's love lived out through us. And so that's going to be the primary theme of today, although phileo is kind of a hit in, in the 1 Corinthians 13 passage as well. But that's sort of where we're going as we think about loving genuinely. So with that in mind, I will not have you stand again, but I do want you to listen now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. You know, and Paul might have been the kind of guy you'd want to go grocery shopping for you because he was a list guy, wasn't he? I'm telling you. He made those lists, and here's another list. Here it is. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, for again, simplicity and maybe to make this a little more memorable and uh, a little more application oriented for us here today, here's what I want to do. We're not going to look at these one at a time as they're listed here in the scripture, but once again, I've kind of packaged them uh, in some categories. And the first thing we want to do, and by the way, this is a typical Bible teaching method. It's a great teaching method, and that's teaching by contrast. In other words, you'll say, here's what something is not, and then here is what something is, and you'll see the stark contrast, and in that contrast, you find the greater truth. Proverbs, for example, in the book, so, book of Psalms, uh, is a great, great example of teaching by contrast. So this is teaching by contrast. So what I want to do is begin with the negative side, if you will, of what love is not or what love does not do. And you're going to find, we will find, that there is, again, a little list of things that love is not and love does not, will not, will never do. And so let's begin there. It says, the scripture says, love does not envy. Let's start with envy. Now, envy is when someone has something that you want that you don't have. You with me? Now, materialistically speaking, it might be that, you know, somebody gets a new car and you're driving an old car and you'd like to kind of, and you would never say that, man, I wish I could have that car. Or maybe somebody has a house or a boat or whatever the case might be. Now, that was really not the context of, of, of 1 Corinthians 13. The context here actually 
with spiritual gifts. At 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's the great teaching on gifts in the body. And what was happening in the church of Corinth is that there were people not envying things that someone else had that they wanted, but they were envying gifts that someone had that they don't have. It would be like someone envying some of these wonderful musicians and you say, well, I can't sing like that or I can't play an instrument like that or I can't teach like that or I can't fill in the blank and I want, that's envy. It's when someone has something that you don't have that you'd like to have and in doing so, the scripture says, love doesn't do that. Love just does not envy. And the flip side of that is, secondly, love does not boast. Now, if envy is you wanting what someone else has that you don't have, boasting is when you do have something and you want someone else to want what you have because it might make you feel just a little bigger about yourself and better about yourself. You with me? And the Bible says, Love doesn't do that. It doesn't envy about what you don't have, what you want, and it doesn't boast about what you do have so so that people around you might think, well, I I wish I was like that, but love does not do that. It also, thirdly, does not insist on its own way. What does that mean? Well, that means love is not selfish. I call it the sin of personal preference. It's possible that you and I could actually commit a sin against someone and even against the church, if you will, uh, with this me first kind of attitude that it's all about me. I remember Rick Warren's book a few years ago, The Purpose Driven Life. You may have read that. And I'll never forget it was a very powerful yet short and simple opening line in that book when he simply opened it with these words, it's not about me. And that is so true. And it's not about you. It's not about us. Love does not insist on its own way. Now look, there's something about human nature. I get this. I mean, is there anybody in here who always wants to be last in line? Come on, you know, no. We don't want to be last in line. You want to be first in line. There's just human nature. I think I was born with a, some kind of homing device and maybe you got it too. Because I can go into a place and if there are two people in a line and there are six people in a line, I will say, I'm going to the line with two people in it. And as soon as I get in that line, as sure as it's almost my turn, they're gonna come over, there's a price check here that, you know, and all of a sudden, the line of six has moved and you're like, I got in the wrong line. Anybody else in here always gets in the wrong line? I get in the wrong line, okay, I I, I can feel your pain. Well, you know, that's human nature. We don't wanna be last, we wanna be first. But love doesn't act that way. Love does not insist on having its own way. And another thing here, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Now that's kind of an odd phrase. Let's talk about that for a moment. What is rejoicing in wrongdoing? That means love never seeks revenge or desires to see someone getting caught when they're clearly doing something wrong, but it's that internal little thing that happens in us when Somebody has done something wrong, and our human nature, our sin nature, again, just kind of, it wells up, and we're rejoicing in wrongdoing. I pastored First Baptist Church of Alexandria, Virginia, back in the mid, uh, early and mid-1990s. And uh, by the way, if you, if you think, if you get to complaining about traffic ever in Columbia, you ain't seen nothing till you live in Washington, D.C., Alexandria's inside the Beltway of Washington, D.C. Some of you probably traveled up there, know it. Uh, the Beltway, as they call it, I-495. And uh, living up there, uh, I, I just learned, I, I kept stuff in my car because you were gonna get, I, I kept water and food. And during the winter, I kept a snow shovel. And I mean, I mean all kinds of stuff because you just never knew when you were gonna get stuck on the Beltway. Well, I had been somewhere Sure enough, I got stuck on the beltway and we were just, it was forever. And many times, a couple of hours was not unusual. So I'm sitting there with all, you know, hundreds of thousands of my closest friends on the beltway. And I look in my right side rear view mirror. And at first I thought it was uh, an emergency vehicle. And I could see it was very small, you know, way, way back there, but it was coming pretty fast in the emergency lane. 
And so I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden, the more I look, the more I look, the more I look, and all of a sudden, this little red sports car comes zoom, flying by me in the emergency lane. Well, I may be a pastor, but I had a little fleshly moment in that, you know. I'm like, man, I'm just, who does that person think he is? I'm over here waiting with him. So the traffic inches up, inches up. Well, we finally get up near my exit, and guess what? There was the little red sports car pulled over by a state trooper. And I, I'm not proud of this. But when I went by, I just kind of waved at him. I was just, I just couldn't help myself. And, and you know what had happened? We can kind of laugh at that, but I, I had resented, if you will. I, I had actually re- rather rejoiced over someone's wrongdoing. The Bible says love doesn't do that. I wasn't very loving in that moment. Those are things that love does not do. But it also says some things that love just is not. It is not. Listen to these four is nots. Love is not arrogant. I think that speaks for itself. The Bible, particularly Proverbs, is full of passages on pride. Pride goes before a fall. And uh, uh, the Bible even talks about the, in that list of things that God hates, arrogance is one of the things that God says pride he just cannot tolerate. Love is not rude. What is rudeness? It's saying hurtful, intentional, harmful things. It's not caring for the feelings of other people. Uh, Love is not those things, according to this list. Love is not irritable. Now, Now, I'm probably getting a little close to home here. Once again, I know we're human, but what is irritable? You know, we're we're all gonna have a bad day. You know, we just wake up on the wrong side of the bed, as they call it. And uh, there are days that circumstances are such, and it's just that you're, you're just, you're just feeling irritable. I saw a little cartoon years ago in a, a pastor's leadership journal, and it, it was, I remember this so well, it was this pastor, and it was Sunday morning, and he had a, he didn't just have a Bible, he had one of those big family Bibles, and you know, he was walking like this into the church, and someone greeted him, hello, pastor, how are you today? And, he said, and the caption said, I'm just looking for somebody to rebuke in the name of Jesus today. I mean, you know, I, you, you ever have that day? Yeah, that's irritable. Well, love doesn't do that. It's like the two ladies who were talking about sleep patterns and diet and, you know, losing a little weight. One of them said, well, do you ever wake up grumpy? And she said, no, I usually just let him sleep. But anyway, you know, we're not talking about that. It's that irritability, and love is not that. Now, we can have a bad day. We can have bad things happen, but it doesn't have to mean that we have to display those kinds of attitudes. Love is not that. It's not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not irritable, and it is not resentful. Ooh, wow. That's a good one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, I've read, I can't tell you how many hundreds of weddings that I've done and how many times I've read this passage. And often in in a wedding ceremony, when I read those verses, I will often say something, because this is exactly what the word means. The word resentful means keeping score. Don't keep score. And if I could just kind of give you a little marital advice here if you're married this morning, don't keep score. Well, I've done more for him than he's done for me, or she's done this, and uh, and that's keeping score. And after a period of time, that scorekeeping, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a reckoning, if you will. And by the way, for the men here today, ladies, don't listen to this, because it's kind of a male secret. I don't know that everybody knows this, but it took me 20 years. I've been married 43 years. Took me about 20 years. Hey, guys, everything is just worth one point. You with me? You know, a call in the middle of the day, hey, baby, I was just thinking about you, or a sticky note on the mirror when she gets up, I love you, and I hope you have a great day. That's one point. Trip to Hawaii, one point. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you you don't get to make it up. I I kept thinking, well, I hadn't done a lot of one-pointers. I'll just do a 20-pointer. No, it doesn't work that way. That's free for everybody here today. Guys, take that. Am I right, ladies? Am I right? I mean, is that generally true? It only counted as one point. Resentful. Don't keep score. So that's what love does not do. This is what love is not. But let's think more positively now. What love is and what love does. And there's a list of these as well. The first one is love is patient. Love is patient. Now, 
We're gonna have a whole message on waiting patiently later. So I won't give you all the thunder on that today. But let me just suffice it to say as quickly as we can, I love the word patient. Even though it's so hard for us to, I mean, you know, James has a lot to say about how we get patience and we don't want to go through what we have to get in order to get patience. But here's what the word literally means. And I'll tell you this again many weeks from now, maybe you'll remember it, but here it is. The word patient literally means long fused. You get me? It's a fuse that you light, but it burns and it burns and it burns and it burns and it burns. It's long. It's a long fuse. It doesn't go off like that. It's, a, it's this slow burn, if you will. And all that, wouldn't that keep us out of a lot of trouble if we would have kind of a slow fuse on our tempers, for example. Love is patient. Love is kind. That's how we treat people. That's really the, the, the golden rule. In essence, if we treat people as we want to be treated, that's what kindness is, treating others with respect. By the way, don't let it be lost on you that these two things that the Bible says love is, patience and kind, made the other list in Galatians chapter five on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. There's no law against treating people kindly. That's why it made the list, patience and kindness. It's like a little boy came home from Sunday school, though, and, and his mother always said, what did you learn this morning? And he said, uh, well, we, we learned about kindness and the golden rule specifically. And she said, well, great. Well, what does the golden rule said? And the little boy told his mom, it says, do unto others before they do unto you. No, that is not the golden rule. But that sometimes is how we kind of work it out. Love is patient, love is kind. And then what does it do? These are a package, four things together and we're done. Love rejoices in the truth. You know, it seems today that there's more rejoicing over a lot of many things that are not true than rejoicing over things that we know are eternally true in God's word. And real love, see we, the Bible tells us, speak the truth, but do it in love. It, don't do it in a harsh way, but just speak convictions and speak values and core beliefs that we have, but do so. It rejoices in the truth. And not only that, love bears with all things. What does that mean? That word bears literally means to cover with silence. And let me translate that for you. Sometimes, and this is the Hollingsworth vernacular here, it just means sometimes it's best to keep your mouth shut. I'm, I'm talking to myself here. You know, that's why, what's the old saying? God gave us two ears and one mouth, you know, so we need to listen twice as much as we speak. The word bears, bearing with all things, means to cover with silence, believes all things. By the way, that's the very same word as faith as well, believes. Those are our conviction. It hopes, let me say this about hope. Hope in the biblical sense is not wishful thinking. Well, I hope, it rains tomorrow, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or I hope I get a raise, or I hope this, or I, that's wishful thinking. No, biblical hope is a sure thing. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is in heaven. Heaven's not a wishful thought for me. It is a sure thing based upon the authority of Scripture. And the Bible says it believes all things, it hopes all things, and yes, it even endures all things. You put all those together, and it's a package, if you will, of what love does. And by the way, that word endures is a great word. A few weeks ago in the Olympics, if you watched any of that, the weightlifters, if you saw any of that, that word endure means to stand under a heavy load. It's what a weightlifter does. It's the ability, if you will, to be able to bear up under a heavy load. Are you under a heavy load today? I guarantee there are people in Afghanistan and in Haiti and on the Gulf Coast that are feeling an incredibly heavy load upon them. There's endurance. Love endures. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what burden you feel like you're bearing under, 
It's the love of Jesus that will help us all endure. I want to close with this thought. The last year and a half or so, it's, it, it, it's just been tough. So many, it, just things coming at us. The COVID pandemic hits and then the racial strife that erupted and all of the uh, clear reminders of how far we have yet to go in matters of true justice not, not, not the socially defined justice, but the biblically defined justice. A, a, a divisive election cycle, and you know, now the COVID's back. I mean, just, and then all these disasters seem to just kind of be pouring upon us. And it struck me that, you know, Satan is a liar, and he's the father of all lies, and he is the accuser of, of the brothers, as the Bible says. In other words, he's a twister. He's a he perverts the truth of the word of God. In Matthew chapter four, in the temptations of Jesus and the wilderness temptations, don't forget that Satan quoted scripture, but he misquoted it every time. And Jesus always cleaned it up and said, no, you, you kind of left part of that out. And uh, Jesus gave the full truth, but Satan was content to give a partial truth. So there is a truth trilogy at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that all of us know. Matter of fact, I, I'm going to get it started. I want you to fill it in. There are three words. And now abide these three. What are they? Faith, hope, love. That's the truth. Faith, hope, love. Satan has sold us a satanic twist and perversion. It's called fear, despair, and anger. Isn't that true? He has he has sold us fear. Don't know what's going to happen next, man. What we're just going, you know, and we are, fear and despair. Despair is the opposite of hope. If you've got hope, you believe that God's in charge. Despair means there's nothing I can do about this, and certainly anger. I mean, my goodness, it's been, you know, political anger and. And, 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 and church anger, if you will, and theological divisions and all kinds. That was a satanic twist and perversions. And so I just simply challenge us all. We got to get back to faith, hope, and love. If we're going to be a church, Shandon, that will be putting our love into action by being the body of Christ, then it begins individually. It begins with me and with you by making sure that we don't do what love would never do and make sure that we always do what love should always do. That's our challenge. That's our charge. That is our hope. Let's pray together. And as I lead us in this prayer, I just wanna remind us this morning that the only way that you can really, any of us can live this kind of life and this kind of faith is by making sure that Jesus Christ is in our lives. And so, if you've never met Jesus as your personal Savior, that's, that's the first step. That is receiving God's love into your life. The Bible, that, that old verse that we know so well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, and that whosoever, anybody who believes in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. And so today I would invite you to receive the love of Jesus if you've never been saved. There are gonna be people back in a place we call the, the Next Step Center. And if you need to meet Jesus today, you can do so today. Just leave this building, leave this room rather, and walk across the aisle, the hall, and you'll go to the Next Step Center and somebody will be there to talk with you and to pray with you. And maybe you already know Jesus, but you are discouraged and you're carrying a heavy burden. You just want someone to pray with you or to find out more about what it means to be a part of this Shandon family. And so, our Father, we ask that during this time of response that your Holy Spirit would continue now to speak truths, your truths, into each of our hearts so that we might be the kind of body, the kind of church that will truly put our love into action. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. And now turn your attention.